We're here today for a discussion on how partnerships between inclusive businesses and SMEs can be accelerated. Now, I think most of us know why these are good for reasons of access to finance, access to markets, uh, uh, to, to um, manpower, but, but how do these work and, and how do you really navigate them is something that we will look to today's panel to throw some light on. Uh, and to do that, allow me to introduce you to our moderator for the day, Patricia Chinsweeney, who is Africa Director at IDEV International. So Patricia is a founding partner of IDEV, which is a management strategy and investment advisory firm focused on building and growing SMEs in emerging markets. She leads their business strategy group, which brings global business best case practices to emerging markets through consulting, partnership development, and supply chains and operations improvement. So on that note, I will leave you in her very able hands. Over to you, Patricia. Everyone's welcome to move up as well. You don't have to stay in the back. Um, because we are going to have a Q&A at the end, and I think uh, it'll be an interesting discussion. Uh, so I just wanted to add um, to that introduction, uh, I think I'm particularly ex excited about this panel uh, because uh, one of the things that, that we've launched at IDEV is also the, a corporate impact initiative in the last year. We announced at SOCAP um, what we felt was the need to uh, increase the conversations between uh, corporations and the impact sector. And when we say impact sector, we're talking about the impact investors, social enterprises, and at the end of the day, SMEs um, and entrepreneurs in emerging markets so that we can have uh, cross-sector collaboration focused on scaling and maximizing impact and returns. Um, so today, uh, we have uh, the premier lineup of speakers uh, across a range of sectors um, and a range of experiences relevant to um, scalable partnerships. Um, first, we have Tony, who is the founder uh, and chief technology architect of Kitabu, uh, which is a subscription-based uh, educational platform uh, that comes with an affordable tablet uh, so that education becomes more affordable for students in Kenya. Um, and uh, I'll let him talk a little bit more in a moment on the, the partnerships uh, that he's established. Uh, next, we have uh, Peter Scott, who is the CEO and founder of Burn Manufacturing. Uh, Burn is a clean cook stove company that is now manufacturing uh, in Kenya, uh, but they do design, manufacturing, distribution. Um, and uh, we'll hear more about uh, his experiences in a moment. Uh, next, we have Doug. Um, Doug Jones is from Bayer, uh, and he has launched a new initiative um, focused on Africa and the Sunrise, Sunrise projects in Africa um, that takes advantage of uh, the resources of a large multinational and pairs it with uh, local corporations. Uh, and finally, we have Andy Narakot from, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> Water and sanitation for the urban poor. Um, so a little bit more of the nonprofit perspective, but where uh, the corporate perspective is very much built into uh, the foundation uh, and also focused on addressing water and sanitation in, in Africa. Um, so I hope I've done you all justice yeah. uh, in a well quick done. intro. Uh, and what I wanted to do to just, just kind of kick this off is uh, talk with each of you. Uh, so give you a, a few minutes to talk about the corporate partnerships that you've developed. Um, and if we can just start, who's the, the partner that, you, uh, that you're working with? Uh, what is the stage of the current partnership? Uh, and anticipated future of that partnership. Um, and then we'll go into a series of questions uh, from there. Okay. Uh, Tony Kitabu. Um, so what we did was in 2012, we started a, a small company with an intention of getting textbooks to students around uh, the country. And we figured that uh, the best way to do that is obviously, you know, five-step program digitize the content, uh, avail the content on digital platforms that allow you know, easy access to respect of where the student is, 
target bottom of permit, which is extremely important, but then also come up with a locally sufficient payment system and allow this to work independent of uh, distribution or any infrastructural problems. The solution is pretty straightforward. We came up with what is called Kitabu, spelled with a Y. Uh, Kitabu in Swahili means book. And it's very, very simple. We are digitizing all the content in the Kenyan education curriculum, putting it on a micro SD that's 8 GB in size. That's nine years of textbook fitting in half that little container called a micro SD. Putting that micro SD in a tablet and a dongle, if you've been in Nairobi, you know what that is. Uh, engaging that with a SIM card, which has mobile money payment, and then giving those or selling those to students in schools. What that allows a student to do is, whereas a normal book would have 60 pages or so, we can rent a page for an hour, a day, a week, a month, or a school term, or they can rent a chapter or a book. So a book that would cost, I'll just throw a figure in the air, a book that would cost $10 for you know a year or for the rest of your life, depending on how long you want to use it, uh, would cost you in Kenyan shillings, six Kenyan cents per page per day. So for 10 shillings, uh, an average parent BOP would be able to buy every textbook in their education curriculum for their daughter or son per week. So it's ridiculous money. Um, but there are two very easy, you know, just the moment you say that, the two things that stand out are why do you plug your dongle in because you can't use a dongle you know, as it is. And, and how do you integrate this with a payment system that, that works sufficiently? So we have two partners and I'll talk about one major partner being Microsoft. Uh, again, if you're in Kenya, you know that uh, there's a digitization progress going on in the education system and Microsoft is the operating system that's working on that platform because they're laptops and desktops. And what Microsoft have done is they have a Microsoft for Africa program that's encouraging apps coming out of Africa to be developed on their platform. And they've picked five in the continent and we're fortunate to be one of the five. A moment of applause. No, don't just. Uh, <clears throat> but what that basically means is that they're going to take the application and see if they can replicate it, not just in, in different um, parts of Kenya, but in different parts of Africa. That's a great boost for us. In terms of the stage we're at, uh, we're now developing the desktop version together. So we have a development team, and they have a development team, and they've gotten married, and they're, they're doing their thing together now. We're trying to come up with the baby as quickly as possible. And what we will create is then what Microsoft will pre install in every laptop or desktop that they create in the continent for education. That's huge. You know, it's really big because that, what that means is you don't have to go to the Windows app and download it. When you buy a laptop or a desktop that is you know, primed for education, that means all the 425,000 the Kenyan government is acquiring or the 717,000 that are going to be in Southern Africa, including I think Zimbabwe and Botswana and whatnot, will come with Kitabu pre-installed. So whether this content or not is another story that depends on publishers, but that's where our partnership is gone. And those are markets we've never been able to access prior to this partnership. Uh, their expertise is extremely valuable and, and there's also money with it. You know, they give us some which is cool, yeah. Uh, but that's where we are. Right now the partnership is seed capital. Seed capital and develop and technical support and mentoring and distribution because you know, that distribution is, is pretty good as well. They've bundled Kitabu with the Windows 8.1 uh, software bundle, so if you are going to buy one for education, chances are you'll see Kitabu in there. Uh, and we, this is a side note, we had started building an Android first, which is finished. We, we did Android, it was finished in December. But because of the Microsoft partnership, we had to slow that down so we can be able to do this because there's a lot more value in having Microsoft as a partner than being able to build an Android and distribute Android tablets. But that's, that's where we are right now. Yeah. Great, thanks. That's very inspiring. I want to quit my job and join you. And yeah, so, but I, I'm, so, I'm stuck in this stupid still business, so I'll stay with it for a little bit longer. So, uh, my name is Peter Scott. I'm the CEO and founder of Burn Design Lab and Burn Manufacturing. So, we design uh, the world's cleanest cook stoves, uh, both in Washington State and here in Kenya. So, uh, our goal is to revolutionize the clean cook stove sector. People have been uh, working on cook stoves for many years. I've been in the space for 20 years. Uh, five years ago, I came to Kenya and I said, some would raise $5 million and build a modern local manufacturing facility to make the best cook stoves in the world. Five years later, that's what we've done. So we've partnered with uh, OPIC, um, General Electric, uh, UN Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves and others and some new equity partners to put together that package to make this revolutionary yet simple charcoal cook stove. So the stove saves 45% of the fuel independently tested by uh, people in the field. And that stove can save people 200 $350 a year in fuel savings, the stove only costs about $40 to buy, so payback period is very short. 
So we see an incredible opportunity to bring you know, millions of these cook stoves out to, to Kenya and eventually all of Sub-Saharan Africa. The charcoal cook stove market is worth about uh, 10, 12 billion dollars right now in Sub-Saharan Africa, growing to 17 billion by 2030. So it is a massive market that is, but is destroying forests and also killing people with indoor air pollution. So uh, our goal is to transform the way everyone in South Africa, in Southern Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Africa cooks. Um, anything else? Yeah, just, can you just briefly talk about GE? And yeah, sure. That but that was the original question, I forgot. Okay, yeah. I, yeah, I got excited about what he was saying. There you go. Yes, COVID partnerships. Um, in 2011, I presented a Fortune magazine's conference. I uh, presented the vision, and OPIC and GE both came up to me at that and said, yeah, we're interested. We'd like to be involved. I didn't know it would take three years for them to actually be actively involved. But um, that, those, that presentation led to the real funding of our project. And so GE has lo loaned us a million dollars. But um, as many people might know, GE is doing a new push into Africa and see great potential like many of the big corporates are seeing in Africa. And so they see this as a, um, a really positive thing to do for Africa, but also a way to help develop their brand. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks. Cheers. I'll ask more thank you. Oh, yeah, sorry. No, it's fine. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Um, I'm Doug Jones from Bayer. Um, Bayer is an international company uh, where we do a lot of developments in, in research. Um, I'd just like to go over a, a, a quick presentation and um, I'll, I'll keep it as quick as possible. I wouldn't want a death by PowerPoint on my hands there. But we'll basically just go over the offerings, uh, challenges, uh, a, a business model project which I'm doing and then partnerships. Um, our offerings uh, range from a greenhouse uh, a solar dryers, um, agricultural waste board, um, housing solutions and cold storage solutions. We are using our products, um, this is in the material science uh, um, division, we've also got the health and nutrition uh, divisions sort of worldwide. But these are the offerings that we have developed um, and it's, it's, it's the, they're basically benefiting uh, the communities in need. Um, I think that the challenge of, of that we've got is, is we need high efficiency, profitability and the sustainability uh, within the agricultural sector to secure the existence of, of millions of people and the growth of the population too. Um, the solution is, is to preserve harvests uh, using developed uh, technologies, preventing post-harvest waste which is our, our, our main objective and reducing the CO2 emissions. Um, using solar drying units for fish, uh, um, spice vegetables. We've done pilot plants in India, Cambodia, uh, um, and Thailand on uh, the solar drying and the, and the cold storage. These are for affordable housing and agricultural waste. The impact is to increase returns, adding value, um, hygiene quality and output, eliminating post harvest waste and also decreasing the CO2 emissions. Um, our business modeling in the Western Cape, uh, we've uh, collaborated with um, uh, the Stellenbosch University in, in South Africa, um, Hortgrow, it's an it's, uh, umbrella for the agricultural uh, sector and they, they've got a section, uh, the Dried Free Technical Services, which they'll be doing all our uh, data collecting and um, trialing and, and basically just proving the business uh, viability of it. Um, they are connected to the, the, the community and also to the market, which um, is quite key to, to actually creating the sales and all that of, of the, 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 the community uh, project. We have got funding from the DEG for this now, which um, will launch probably in about four weeks' time. With the partnerships, I think the, the main challenge was to, to we initially prospected, we selected, we had to select the correct partner. Um, we needed commitments from the partners uh, um, and then also, you know, to, to prove the business viability. Um, the types of partnerships, we've got universities and research institutes and SMEs in appropriate fields. Um, I think with the, for the partners, um, the benefits with working for large corporations is uh, um, we are connected in establishing the different fields. Uh, 
the, the, research, the scaled research and development in new technologies. Um, we put a lot of, last year we put 35 billion uh, in, into research and development, as I've said. And uh, we have got available capital, uh, you know, to invest in the projects. Um, and also, we've got a social and ethical responsibility as, as far as a, a corporate citizen goes. I don't know if that's... Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andy Narakot. I'm from Water and Sanitation for the Urban Pool. What's up? <laughs> Budweiser made us famous. Um, so... I, um, so I'm Deputy CEO of WhatsApp, and I've headed up. I head up WhatsApp Enterprises, which is a um, a specialist business unit of our non-profit, which specialises on business solutions to water and sanitation. Um, our partner is Unilever. Unilever, they are scaled themselves. 2.6 billion of their products get used every day, and they are actually already on our board. So WhatsApp is a partnership or an alliance, in, as some people call it. Uh, it's an alliance of for-profit, three for-profit uh, co companies, corporates, and three non-profits. So um, Unilever is on our board, is one of our for-profit uh, members. And uh, there was already an existing relationship built in with Unilever through our governance. But it was only through the foundation arm. So it was always a bit of CSR money saying, well, we are supporting WhatsApp. Uh, the partnership that I have at the moment is um, around two social enterprises that we've developed with them in partnership. One is in Ghana called Clean Team. Clean Team is a, um, a sanitation business that uh, is a portable toilet that we um, provide to households who pay us a monthly regular fee and we empty the toilets two or three times a week. Now that business, uh, and the other one is Smart Life. Smart Life is a water vending business here in Nairobi. Some of you know it. It is, um, it sells clean drinking water in 10 or 20 litre jerry cans uh, through a subscription model, door-to-door um, -door delivery, and also sells nutrition and hygiene products through uh, education and, and well, sales and marketing. So those two are, are very different. One came before the other. Our sort of breakthrough partnership was with Clean Team. So maybe around four years ago, I had a call. Or someone put me in touch from someone from Unilever. The, that someone was in their research and development wing, so um, separate to where our governance relationship was within Unilever. And they said, uh, apparently you know something about sanitation. And, and he said, well, my boss has just told me to go and do, uh, do something in sanitation in Africa. It was literally was his brief. Um, and he said, well, have you got any ideas? Uh, and he actually showed me a little piece of work that a, um, a management consulting innovation firm had done for them at great cost, a little uh, PowerPoint presentation. He said, does this mean anything to you? Uh, and, and I said, well, actually, yes. It's something I've been thinking about for a long time, and this could work really well here. And, and I had loads of ideas, and it kind of just, we, all, we just sort of worked well together. We developed ideas. We went, who can we work with for this? So we, we uh, partnered with IDEO, for a design firm in, in the US, and we went out and um, did a lot of opportunities, insights, work, and figured out what would a business, what a good business model would look like here in Ghana, uh, and all the rest of it. And that was really the beginning of the partnership. Um, and as a result of the success of that first partnership, someone else within Unilever got wind of this. They said, wow, we're already working with you. It's a real success over there. Let's come and do something over here in water in Nairobi. And, and uh, we've, we've just incorporated that company um, today. I signed the, the papers that um, is the beginning of that company here in, in Nairobi. Um, the stage um, the stage of the partnership um, with Clean Team, we are just, well, it's about the fourth year of a partnership, and that's unheard of with them. These R&D partnerships are very, normally very short, have a quick exit. If they don't make an exit to another part of the business, then they, they can it. So it's, it's really amazing that we've had this long uh, relationship with them. Um, we're now looking at other areas of the Unilever business, from investing to their marketing, so developing cause-related marketing um, partnerships 
we're looking at their, uh, their social arm, so they have a social business plan, where they want to uh, get big numbers around sanitation with that. And then there's something else, there's a separate initiative called the Toilet Board, which they've, uh, Unilever have, um, have set up as well. So there's lots of different avenues that we may progress to, which would be help us, our social enterprise in Ghana, move to scale. And, uh, and, and, and it's a similar, but a little bit of an early, earlier stage with Smart Life. The future of the partnership, as alluding to that a little bit more so, is they have a ventures arm, so it could be a typical uh, venture capital relationship, and they can invest uh, seven million in the business, but they want a quick exit, so it's, it's, uh, they want double digit returns, so it doesn't really quite fit with us as a social enterprise. Uh, it could be cause related marketing, but they want to see significant scale before a big brand gets involved. So it's a bit un unknown right now, but what we do know is we've got a 12 month commitment from here on because we've got a lot of interest from uh, big um, uh, development inst institution to commit more funding to get us to break even, to get us to where we're taking our first investment and, uh, and then we, we scale to, to other countries and things from there. And the type of assistance, it was literally an R&D budget, so they came to us and said, uh, so you can help us in Ghana? And I said, yes. And he said, well, what, what would that look like? And how much? And I she, 100,000 pounds maybe? And he said, right, write that down on a piece of paper and send it in. Uh, and literally I bought, uh, he bought a pilot from us and that was it. You know, it wasn't a proposal or anything like that. It was, it was their systems. That's how they work with consultants. So why couldn't they work with us as an NGO like that? So I literally wrote it down in two pages. So this was what the pilot would look like. Send it to the finance team and the money arrived and that was it. So, uh, quite good. So simple. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, good, thank you. Uh, okay, good. Um, so, so following on to that, uh, I want to ask all the, the entrepreneurs, uh, and you've all alluded to this a bit, but when did you start engagement with these corporate partners? Um, if you can talk a little bit about the process. I mean, I think the key theme that we're seeing is Corporate partnerships are great, but they take much longer than probably anyone would, would ideally um, like them to, to establish. Um, what was that process like? And what was the biggest thing? I mean, not in the process, but in partnering with the corporation, what has surprised you the most about how that's either rolled out particular challenges that you face that you didn't expect? Um, uh, two maps. Two maps. <laughs> um, so we are now. You're talking four years. You're talking five years. Um, we are three going on three months now. <laughs> like, yeah, they can give you some tips. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, you work how fast did it take you to get that money? That's excellent. Um, we've had a different. We've had a, so Microsoft is very different from many other companies because they're trying to innovate. They're trying to be fast. They're trying to be young. Uh, they change their CEO. Uh, mm -hmm. and they're awesome. And there's, there's this push to just try and get the whole company to be rejuvenated, which, which is a great value. Give me that microphone. Thank you. Uh, so there's a lot of that, and that's definitely helped uh, us. That's the first thing. The second thing was, I don't know where your partnerships were with, or where the source of the partnerships was, whether they were in Africa or they were uh, from other parts of the world, but our team is fully African, and uh, the person who was in charge, in fact, she was having a session earlier, is called Amrota Adela. She's, she's, from, she's Ethiopian. And being uh, a local team, we've had a very positive interaction with the corporate uh, engagements we've had, because they understand the need we're trying to solve. So those two things have been of great advantage, even as we got announced as one of the five Microsoft for Africa programs like a week ago, we've had this engagement previous. They have already said that they're going to show us, I mean, they've shown great interest, they're going to show us what they can. They've given us Azure, the cloud solution to sort out uh, uh, the contents. So we've, we've had a, it's starting well. Uh, we haven't done massive capital fundraising, you know, we're, we're still in the $500,000 range, $350,000 that we're looking for kind of range and they're giving us some of that. But um, in the long term, it's a very hit the iron while it's hot scenario. Uh, the Kenyan government has already put in the push for education platforms. They want Microsoft to be operating system. The laptops have been developed with factories that are being brought in. There's tendering process. Like there's a vibe going on. If you don't catch it while the vibe is hot, then you know, you lose that train. Whereas for you guys, it doesn't seem like there was a vibe. It's just, you know, this is what we need to do and let's do it. So I guess that's the, the way we're riding. And so we're fortunate 
it's not in a way. Uh, if we were in energy or if we were in sanitation, the conversation has been very consistent for a couple of years, so it could take three years to get an email back or whatever. Uh, and, and that's that's what we're trying to avoid. But again, I think one of the reasons why I think being in this panel is really good is because I make everyone optimistic that things can work really well. Like, things, you know, you just give it a shot. It can't be so bad. But at the same time, there's a realism check that these two brothers will help you see that it could take a while and things could be difficult. So that's that's my experience. We hope it stays this way, you know. I'm, I'm like knocking on wood all the time. Uh, but all things said and done, it started well. And let's see that it is in a year or so. All right, so now, now the reality check, Peter. <laughs> What surprised you the most? What's been the most fun in this process? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's the, the term of patient capital, which is normally applied to investors, but it's really for entrepreneurs. So you really have to be able to be, yeah, patient for capital. Um, so yeah, it, it just takes time, and you know, I, because I think if you're an entrepreneur who's really driven to see the impact, well, what else are you going to do? You just have to sit there and, and wait. You know, when G and OPIC approached me, you know, OPIC said it could be two months to have a deal done. Um, and then it took us two and a half or three years. So it's just, uh, I guess, don't, don't believe investors. That's lesson number one. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I mean, it's just that, it's, it's just that really, especially, I, I don't know if people are familiar with OPEC, but I mean, uh, Overseas Private Investment Corporation is part of the U.S. government, but also has to uh, earn a profit. And it's, um, so it's a, it's a bank, but also connected with the government, and it's, it's very slow moving. We've been lucky to have people like Hillary Clinton and other people at the State Department that really push that. So having people um, in, having government allies, both pushing the, the GE side and the OPEC side has been really helpful for us. Yeah, in fact, it's sort of interesting what happened was, um, I don't know if anyone is in here from GE, but basically OPEC wrote a press release that Hillary Clinton was going to make saying that the deal was done and had GE's name on it, and GE just didn't bother to say that they hadn't signed off on the deal yet. So they actually kind of slipped through GE's process. Um, so I mean, that didn't expedite it. What's that? That didn't expedite the close. Uh, no, it did absolutely. Okay. It, Okay. It absolutely did, yeah, because then, G, then G's name was publicly on it, and Hillary Clinton made the announcement, and so it was too late. They couldn't take it back. So that's, you know, get a good friend in a communications department to write an email, and you'll be fine. Um, so uh, what else can I say about the GE, GE relationship? I think, uh, I think maybe similar to what Annie was saying is that when GE looked at us, they looked at it first like a foundation side, then sort of CSR, and then it went to equity, and then it went to GE Capital, and so it just took this very circuitous route till it finally landed in this this one place that we were, you know, it would have been better if it just been a grant. But the fact that it was, they were, um, there was, it just could be a lot of twists and turns to get you to that final deal within the corporation. Um, and then the other thing is that I think once the corporation sees the, the real benefit, then there's this incredible CSR machine or communication machine that can come to support it once they see that tangible benefit. So it's really worthwhile to wait for that because I could have got a million dollar investment from just some other no-name entity, but having the GE brand behind us is, is, is just enormous. You know, we're, do, we're doing a ribbon cutting next two, two weeks at the new factory, and the GE whole corporate machine is now behind that. So it, it really is worthwhile for us to, to have that partnership. Does that cover it? Yeah, no, I think that's good. Okay. And, and just to be clear, with, with both of you, your partnerships have been through the for-profit R&D business side of things, at least initially, and then maybe down the line there's some other elements coming in, the CSR group, the foundation. That's correct? Okay. Yeah. I don't know if you want to add anything. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Some uh, few uh, sign that says popping at that, that stage. So just thinking, you know, when we were when we developed, started our relationship with Unilever, it was very early stage. In fact, it was just an idea. So in that way, it was very low key, and it didn't. We didn't uh, blow a lot of have a big fanfare about this. We kept it between just me and one other person within Unilever. We didn't want, because. It, it's, it becomes very political when it gets bigger and when it gets out and when it gets publicized. That was, that was the approach that my counterpart with the new deliver took. But if you were a later stage um, enterprise, 
if things are working quite well, that's when they want to have the photo in their, their magazine and they want to get the marketing teams behind it because it's high risk for them. If, if their marketing teams are shouting about this amazing partnership then, uh, and it fails, then that's, they don't want to be anything to do with that. So I think it's helpful to actually know, have a think about where you are at your business and that will help you decide who to target within the corporate. And, and the, the, so the, the CSR foundation arm was, is kind of our, through our governance. We, we still have not had any uh, relationship with them because we can't produce the significant numbers, which is what the foundation looks for, yet. Obviously, that would happen at a much later, but later stage. Yeah, I was just going to say as well, one of the things that we saw, we had a, uh, a closed workshop at SoCap, so we brought in corporations, um, and some of the people that have connected me with some of these people um, to that. And what was interesting is that when you do have these large corporations, they do have to be very cautious about their public brand. So in some regard, in your situation, you know, they prefer to work with something smaller, off the radar, test it out, and then once it was proven successful, that's where you can really promote it. And maybe it's also because it's not capital intensive, um, you know, it, it's going under the radar, and then you have the big pop, you have the big ads that I think you're going to want to really see, and the, the, the full story. So did you want to add to that? Yeah. Uh, one of the things that we really want to support because we're a really small startup, like my office is like a prison cell, it's not very large, it's a private company. And one of the things we have to do is, is even as we're trying to get this partnership, so two things I have to be careful about. Uh, the first thing I have to be careful about is their bottom line. You have to recognize that they're still trying to make a profit. So for us with Microsoft, the reason why we jumped in with us really quickly is because of the cloud product. Uh, the cloud computing is huge now. And we have an education curriculum for a country on a cloud solution anywhere. That's hundreds of millions of dollars worth of revenue for them in the next 10, 15, 25 years ago. So that's one thing that Marshall Sigmund worked is very small. And the second thing though is, and this is the beauty of being a startup and being able to be popular about it, is in technology, you fail faster. It's easier when the tech solution fails as it can be interested and we launch really quickly. As for other corporations, other types of companies, that's difficult, you know, especially in the design. One of the investors knows you very well, came to the store, the banks, he's one of the guys who goes to the 98, he was one of my investors. So he showed us the, the possibilities of, of failing and getting them fast, but you also need to explain that to corporate companies. And some corporate companies are not versatile in that, in that way. So we can still start failing and succeed in that way. And when we have those mega PR situations, it's a good problem for us. So we joined Kerry, we started the one around Malaysia, we got two and a half million praise of this Kenyan innovation solution that's changing education around Africa. We haven't gone through schools yet. <laughs> so it's huge, he's doing it, bro. It's huge, bro. So then that and something happened, like I put that in a drawer, and then we just launched it around like in 50 or 60 schools and get able to say it's not 50 or 50 that he said it last week. But that's just that's, some of the things that we have to watch over as we go. Good, good. Thank you. All right, Doug, we need to get a corporate perspective. Um, so from your experiences, let, let's take this and turn it around. Um, one, what have been the key surprises or challenges that you faced that you didn't expect? And also, you know, in the face of the corporations, uh, what are the real upsides that you see for these businesses to partner with a banker? Yeah, well, I think you know we're on the other side of the fence, but but it works both ways. Um, you know, we as a corporate are trying to find SMEs, uh, appropriate SMEs, um, and partnering with them. Uh, we do back them up as far as uh, um, applying for funding. Um, we've just got a, a PPP funding for for the one project. Uh, the Project Sunrise isn't uh, um, isn't uh, linked to the CSR, you know, Bayer CSR either. So this is a total separate uh, um, project with which we initiative, which which we are driving uh, uh, to to uplift the, the BIP. And um, so I think from from our perspective, our initiative, it's it's slightly different to the other corporates, uh, um, you know, with the CSR or they expecting returns and all that, but. Um, you know, we, we are backing the, the, the SMEs up uh, as far as our 
connections, um, our capital uh, uh, investment, and you know, just um, sort of out our ethical responsibilities as far as a corporation goes. And in terms of the capital that's been allocated to the to Sunrise in general, was that set aside in advance, or that's something that you can bid for within the company? No, it's per, per project. So, you know, whatever funding we get from, uh, for example, the Western Cape with the DEG funding, um, whatever we've got uh, from from the DEG, we, we put in exactly the same amount um, as far as our materials go, um, our technical assistance, management, project management, and, and that's from, from that side of it. So, um, yeah, the funding is, is basically we, we put, we're putting in 50% uh, uh, and then plus the, all our um, technology, you know, our developed technology, which, which we've sort of developed over the years. So, so yeah, we, we are actually assisting the, uh, um, the SMEs all as much as we can to also achieve our objectives. And just to add a little bit more depth to this, so when did you first um, develop the concept for Sunrise, and how long did it take to 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 secure the first round of capital? So we're going to say the DG's Yeah, Sunrise probably started about two and a half, three years ago, and um, I've only joined them the sort of last year. Um, I've started full time uh, this year with with uh, with Africa to roll it out into Africa. Uh, we started with pilot plants in Thailand, Malaysia, and India, doing cold storage and, and the fruit drying. Um, worked with the Thailand universities there um, to prove the case studies. So it's been quite a long road. Uh, we've, we've proved uh, a business viability in, in those countries, but I think you know, as far as proving in Africa with the different conditions, different situations, um, we'd have to prove have individual uh, uh, proof of uh, um, viability and, and partnership. And yeah, so I mean, it's it's actually a new beginning for for um, Sunrise Africa. We've already got. The, it took more than just over six months to get the funding from the DEG. But um, from there, uh, we'll be launching in about four weeks' time in the Western Cape for the fruit drying project. And um, from there, I mean, there's definitely, I mean, there's potential in, in the whole of Africa for cold storage and fruit drying. You know, the whole preservation of, of the uh, the loss of, of post-harvest uh, waste, you know. So I think there's, there's enormous potential in Africa and uh, I, I think at, at some stage we're going to really get to a point of, of having to develop, because of all four, the four offerings, we're going to have to actually sector Africa into sections and, and get people to, to run each sort of section of Africa. So, I think you know, two of the key themes that are coming up here are, one, realistically, the two challenges between corporate and SME partnership come down to um, finding the right person within an organization uh, on the entrepreneur side looking for corporate partnership, uh, on the corporate side finding the right businesses or local partners that are truly a strategic fit. Um, and then separately, timing. Um, timing, uh, which sounds like I'm in the range, we'll see, we'll see where you go, but of um, two to three, up to five years, it's really building out something which fortunately, once it gets to that point, seems to ease and really pay off in the longer term. Um, if you were to pinpoint one to two things that could be changed to um, improve this process, what would that be? What? One, one, one. Yeah, number one. We're going to keep it short because then we're going to open up to the audience with some questions. You guys got to think about this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's the, it's so obvious. I mean, yeah, it's so obvious that yes, if it was done faster, it would be a lot better. But what, what would make it faster? Uh, I mean, it's, just, it's not, you're not going to be able to do a corporation and have it be done fast. It's just not going to happen. So it would be foolish to kind of uh, 
try and you know to think you can make it move fast. I don't think there is really a way to make it move faster. You just have to sit and and endure it. Uh, I mean, uh, but I, mean, I think each of our deals is very specific. So I can think of some really specific things to our particular deal. But I don't think there's really like you know lessons learned that I could share about that uh, that component of it. So that's why we're all maybe just drawing a bit of a blank. Yeah, I think blank on the here, please. Still, I'm not But for me, it's a culture problem. Corporates don't have a see the three of us, the four of us now, are ignorant and we believe we can change the world. You know, that's the mindset. Do you have that mindset? Yes. See, do you have that See, I'm sure you have it. See, you've got it. And that kind of naivety is what we walk into our corporate culture. We will change the world in two and a half years. Wait, you see. And Charles will have a tablet. That mentality makes us kind of live for what we work all the time. Like, we want to get this done. A corporate companies, a lot of the people we meet have a very, I did this on Tuesday, I'm doing this today, I'm probably going to do this tomorrow mindset. And that slowness is what's really, you know, that is, it's a lack of entrepreneurship in the culture. So we, we're fortunate in Microsoft, in, that Microsoft had a, a small kind of like a group of people in Microsoft Africa. They pulled out of the, of the rest of the team and they are really, you know, they're new projects. Uh, but I don't know about GE, I definitely don't know about anybody you work with, but it's, it's that, you know, let's get this done, let's do our best. And I, I see a lot of opportunity for Sunrise in Africa. If you can lean forward and do that, because 80% of this country is built around agriculture directly. So being able to come up with cold storage, greenhousing solutions that you know, we can lean forward that too, there's a lot of people gonna pick it up and, and run with it quickly. So that's just what I, that's what I, those are the things that came out of the top of my head. Yeah, I think I'll ditto that definitely. And um, I think to speed things up, um, we need forums like this, we need to network, um, connect, and, and I think this is also assisted with, with me uh, within the, the, the past eight months to get funding and, and it's mainly just been pushing networking. Uh, fortunately, I was in an ideal situation with the Western Cape uh, with the whole agricultural belt there, all the institutes are all very well connected. So the, the institutes, universities and the, the um, agricultural field are very connected. So when I went down there, it almost happened immediately, but um, it can be very frustrating if, if they sort of all apart and you, you're trying to find uh, uh, and search for, uh, um, you know, and prospect for for certain partners. Uh, um, so yeah, from and, and also I can understand the SMEs or the entrepreneurs' frustration with the, the corporate attitude. Um, uh, and um, yeah, so the, but there are certain corporates or, or corporations who are really they're, they're wanting to push and, and drive all these in, initiatives and um, there are measures and indicators being put in place for the objectives to be achieved. I think one other thing, if you are going to work with a larger corporation, and it is taking time for a deal to come through, uh, it's actually really valuable time. Like if the money had come to us two and a half years ago, we wouldn't have been ready for it. So taking that time to build your team, uh, build your product, all of those things. And for us, the money really arrived at exactly the right time. So not wanting to like let corporations off the hook here, that you can move slowly, but there is, you know, make use of that time while you're waiting for the check to come in. Um, so, yeah, so coming at it from a, so I'm non-profit, so okay, I actually think corporates move a lot quicker. It, it is bizarre to, use, to hear you say that. So I don't know anyone else who's thinking about partnerships as a non-profit, but things typically move quite slower than non-profits. If there's one thing I could change is being more responsive to our corporate partners. So the things that we bring to the, the value that we bring to the partnership with Unilever is that we have a lot of funding channels, channels for funding for uh, continuing what this, this seed capital that they've, con that they've allocated. When we put a proposal together for a certain large uh, bilateral, I'm not saying who, it's definitely not England, uh, it, it took nine months to get a response. And they could not believe it. The thing might have been dead in nine months. We were, and we were moving so quickly, we didn't even know what the, if the business would be what it is in nine months' time. So that was just crazy. And, and actually, so a lot of the other things, so I'm, I have a finance team, so things have to be processed through our uh, things, and we're running a pilot. Uh, the business on the ground needs to be have immediate access to, to finances and, okay, 
we have a big governance thing as well, and all the all the um, all of the accounts of our subsidiary business need to be subsumed into our non-profit accounts in the yearly audits. You know, things like this, it makes it actually quite difficult to, to run a social enterprise for a non-profit. Um, so I wish, I mean, we're, we're it's only 70 employees in six countries, so it's not a lot of, of not big, um, but we can, and we can be more responsive to the Goliaths in the non-profit sector, but I just wish it was, we could have been more responsive in this whole thing, because, you know, the value that we brought was funding, and we've managed to raise significant funding on the back of all of this since then, but it's been a long and, and tedious process. And, and I, I think also something that, that we talked about the other day is the fact that you had corporations built into the foundation, and so the public-private partnership built in the foundation was up, and that also may have facilitated and made certain partnerships smoother mm -hmm. than if you're just starting and you're just winning. You're just approached, or someone hears you talk, and now they're, you know, a corporation is starting to dabble in this concept of impact investing or playing an impact sector. Sure. I, I would also say, and I don't know what you guys think about this, but some of the things that came out of the workshop we did was one, um, there is a language barrier. So, one, you look at development, you look at the impact sector, there's a different language. Mm -hmm. There literally needs to be translation between that and the corporate world. The structures of these organizations is different within the corporate sector, but really a lot of players are all operating differently. And it's finding that person within a business that's the champion and that has the weight to also get the approval on different levels. Um, some of the other things that we saw is, um, and, and something that we're working on is how do you take a corporate consultants, um, particularly those that are thinking about emerging market strategies, um, CSR, um, this shared value concept that Michael Porter came up with a while back, and how do you integrate that with what impact the advisors are doing. So now, you know, we can come and say, hey, we know you guys and what you're looking for in terms of partners to expand your distribution, um, provide working capital, whatever. Um, and the corporate advisors, uh, sometimes it's internal corporate um, advisory as well. They know what the corporation needs and is looking for five years down the line. Um, and I would say, uh, you might agree with me with this, but that's what Unilever has internalized a bit. Um, and maybe another reason why we've been able to uh, build a partnership faster than some other yeah. companies. And yeah, I, that, that uh, concept of return on investment, so w what are the expectations of this seed funding that the corporate has? In some departments, it's a 10-year it's a horizon because they see the, the BAP developing in emerging markets. Again, terminology we call the third word, developing world. It's a developing in emerging markets is, is actually the terminology. So, um, what, what, you know, they see that as the future consumer base, so invest in it now, and that is very forward-looking. And so many uh, corporates are, are really not even there yet. But working with a marketing team, they want to see ROI in a year, less than that. There's nothing, there's no, no qualms about it, so we can never have that sort of relationship with them. I was just wondering, from, maybe from, you could say from a corporate perspective, your projects, what was, what was your expectation? Well, on, goal? Yeah, yeah, an expectation on bottom line from the activities that you're doing. Yeah, we were approaching with Project Sunrise, uh, you know, there is an economic uh, um, pillar which, which we do measure, the sort of a triple bottom, but um, I think with Project Sunrise, uh, it's slightly different. Uh, um, we're not really putting a, a time onto a, a return on investment at all. Um, it's, it's mainly uh, to develop uh, um, underserved markets, you know, and um, BRPs, and, and so I think it's it's, it's more about our ethical responsibility. Um, as far as a massive uh, corporation goes, you know, and we put a lot of money into R and D, but also we also need to. Well, the R and D is helping us with our technology to be able to assist. Uh, um, so I think we on, on Project Sunrise we come in more on, on that aspect. So as far as return on investment, um, we're not really focusing on, on that. It's, you know, there, there is there's definitely uh, our products, there will be sales and that um, on the material side, but then we've also, also got the healthcare and the crop uh, science products too, which I, I know they, they probably expect a, a, a quicker return on investment than uh, a Project Sunrise initiative uh, goes. Yeah, so for, I mean, I'm in a, quite a good position as far as that goes. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
great. Um, I want to quickly reach out to the audience. I don't know how are we in time. Okay. Uh, does anyone have questions from the audience? Um, looking to go into partnerships, uh, either on the corporate or the uh, the uh, SME side. You know. Uh, my name is Nina Henning. I work for Messi Johnson. Um, I manage a portfolio of projects here in Africa that are blending social health impact and commercial viability. We have not yet um, engaged in any SME partnerships, um, but I had a question about something that Patricia raised earlier. I think it was related to taboo and burn. Um, she asked you all if the, the partnerships with Microsoft and GE were coming out of their for-profit arm of their business, and I believe you both said yes. And I was just curious then what the expectation is for your corporate partners in terms of the return. Do they, do they have an equity stake in both of your enterprises, or how, how does that work if it's coming out of the for-profit arm of their businesses? Uh, you go first because you're the <laughs> sure. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, as I was mentioning, it started maybe at uh, GE Foundation and then got moved over to GE Africa and ended up in GE Capital. So they have, it's a debt deal that we have with GE. Um, I mean, I can't really give you the, the pricing on it, but it's, it's um, um, yeah, it's slightly high, higher than maybe uh, we would like and slightly higher than sort of a, uh, maybe what an impact fund might be looking at. So yeah, I can't give you real specifics on it, but it's dead. But the thing with GE that's interesting is that it, it's living in uh, GE capital, but if it's a success, then that will change how it lives in GE, and then maybe then GE would switch to from debt to equity, or just see it as this is just a CSR investment. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. She was not convinced. Yeah, not at all. No, you should convince her somehow. She's she's hotel. <laughs> um, we we are in the same. We're in the first phase of those. Microsoft for Africa is a is a non-profit part of Microsoft. So what they do is they identify a few. They will give you grant money first. So we got twenty thousand dollars grant money first. Then based on our revenues, they make a projection on their revenues to see whether they want to do a five hundred thousand or one million dollar equity in, or uh, if they're going to do a convertible debt. Um, and because Kitabu is, uh, is doing content, we are going to be using and hiring as well the cloud storage service. And so based on that, they want to see if, in fact, instead of giving you um, equity or debt, if we can be able to have a revenue loan. So if in the next five or seven years we'll be able to do revenue turnarounds of X, X amount of money paying for hosting in Azure, can we lend you that money? And then as you pay us back, you lend us, you give us back our money in interest rate. So what we have, fortunately, is the missteps of these guys. Like, there's, there's a lot of corporate companies moved out of doing CSR, because that's what it initially used to be five, seven years ago. They'd give you CSR money, say goodbye, and then walk away. Um, then companies like yours, which are interesting to a core business of a company, showed up. But because they don't know if you succeed or not, they give you grant money first, and they, they move you around, because they don't know exactly where you fall. Um, they and didn't give us grant money. Oh, they never it, it, they thought no. about giving us grant money. He says they thought about then they didn't. Yeah. Um, so for us, they gave us grant money, because they felt the best way to sift through the crowd, because EdTech is pretty popular around the world right now. Let's give a few of them money, see which one is doing pretty well, then sift those, pick them up, you know, baby some, mentor them as businesses and as individuals, then see where up the ladder goes. So that's the, the trajectory we're following. So eventually they would like us to be one of their partners in the sense that um, we host the content on their cloud service, we pay for that hosting, but then they help us scale, which helps us get more users, which help us get more content, which gives us more stuff to put on their, on their cloud solution, which makes us pay them more. So it's kind of like a cyclical way. So it's, it's almost, uh, I don't know, there's a word for it where, you know, like, it's, it's climbing on each other. It's like, you know, that kind of thing. So that's the relationship we've got, which, which I think is really great for us. Yeah. Do you want to add to it? 
so Nina, nice to meet you finally. We've uh, <laughs> contacted on email many times. Um, so the first step for, for Unilever was quite clearly market creation. So as we with their R&D arm, they have a much longer um, horizon for return on investment. It was simply market creation. More toilets in the world, more toilet cleaners sold. Simply, it was a very simple equation. Actually, it was quite nice. Um, so there was a there was a clear link between one of the toilet products and toilet brands, and uh, more sanitation in the world, which is what exactly what we as a non-profit wanted as well. But then, as we uh, evolve and that partnership partnerships evolves, it is looking for somewhere else in the business. And now we're starting to appeal to the uh, social impact. You know, because Unilever are quite forward. They have this uh, Unilever Social Living Plan, which measures social impacts of their business. Um, so they're they're interested as well. And then and then other you know the marketing teams may be interested as well because they like to back something successful and all the rest of it. Um, but. The, yeah, it was it was quite refreshing for us to have that uh, that partnership uh, with that, that specific arm of Unilever, the uh, research and development arm that looks for those long-term plays, uh, and, a, and, and which they've now developed a, a new business unit within Unilever as well, looking at uh, developing an emerging market. So there's a there's a clear link there as well. Um, but the the, the, the investment uh, will is. The, None of it was, uh, there was no discussion of, of any investment whatsoever with us because it was a concept. Uh, but later on, as we evolve through, we're getting, we will be passed around from pillar to post. We are talking about the ventures arm, uh, plus any other arm as well who has an interest in it. Great. Uh, welcome to the panel. Uh, one more question? Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, we'll take one more question. Hello everybody. Uh, my name is Lawrence. I work for Greenlight Planet. We produce uh, solar lanterns. Um, I have a question about, you were talking about the difference in, um, let's say, timing between the corporate world and, and the entrepreneurial world. I am also very curious about um, the, the power balance. So when you're dealing with a huge corporate, um, how do you make sure that the power balance, which is always, I guess, in favor of that corporation, um, is not, you know, benefits both of you, if you understand what I mean. I mean, they, they basically have, you know, much more of what you want than the other way around. They have the capital, the access to the market, the, you know, the brand, etc. And, you know, this might, might sound a bit negative, but what I mean is, how do you make sure that your stakes, your ideas, your concepts will always, you know, be at least a 30, 40 percent part of the of the plan of your corporation? Um, I was, uh, yeah, I have something. So uh, this is an interesting point because I. Uh, Smart Life Business is, is, is the second case I'm telling you about this session, second business we've set up with Unilever. We had another we had another partner on the uh, in the uh, in our partnership as well, who was another NGO, who, and and they came to we were having some discussions about agreements and setting up an agreement between the, tri, the as a tripartite agreement because we were all contributing cash actually for that one, and the, the NGO said uh, they had some uh, done some challenge in one of the clauses in the agreement, which was basically Unilever, a big company, saying. We have the right to the IP, we have the right to this, we have the right to that. They, they got really hung up on that. It's not fair, you're a big company, um, you know, you shouldn't, that's just bullying. And, and actually, you know, my response to that is this is this partner, Unilever, they have, they're the only ones who have a chance of taking this enterprise to scale. If those are their um, those are their terms or they walk away, I don't care, you know? Just I it doesn't matter that you know that we're an NGO. We're small. They are. They they're all about scale. They know how to take things to scale. If you really want thing, you know, social impact at, at huge scale, don't worry about it. You know. Anyway, they're not interested in small businesses. Really, they really want to make you succeed. But they do just want to hang on to the reins a little bit just to make sure you don't go and uh, s um, sit on a panel sometime and tell everyone all your secrets um, or anything like that. You know. Oops. <laughs> Uh, 
have a social charter written into it so that we can't go off mission. So that's, you know, but I think your question was more about they could use us, like they could use us for their own PR purposes. Is that maybe more, more towards your question? Well, yeah, partly. It's, it's about IP, but also about, um, let's say, the whole process. The, uh, the risk is that, um, you know, um, every step you take, you get more and more entangled in the uh, procedures, the structures of the board. And you lose, for example, flexibility. You lose um, a brand ownership of yourself, right? So that's very relevant for your stores as well, I guess. Yeah. Um, if you give them, if you give them equity, I think that I mean that, that that's an issue for us for with any equity partner or any investor. But as long as we maintain, you know, 80 80 percent or 50 percent of ownership of it, I mean, for us, we want to keep more than 50 percent. That that isn't we don't have to worry about sort of mission drift or mission creep or something like that because we're very close to the top. I'd also say, um, so in a lot of the, the advisory work we've done, um, we've certainly seen companies where they got into too close to intertwined partnerships, right? So scenarios where their key buyer is also providing the working capital and the loans. Mm -hmm. And that's fine if you are lucky, <laughs> like if you don't have the right corporate partner who really wants to grow his business with you. But if you don't have a corporate partner who um, understands the nuances of that or the need of a smaller business to get working capital at a very specific time, you do and can become victim to their mismanagement or whatever their structure happens to be uh, that may not be in line with what's going to help you to grow. Uh, so I think that's a consideration. I think also it's a really good point that when we're talking about structuring it as a contract, so a consulting engagement to begin with, or we're talking about debt, you are exposing yourself to um, to less risk if you build in okay, the right structure. Debt can still expose you to risk. Um, and, and equity, um, in some cases, maybe equity is even safer as long as it is a you know, minority yeah. share, right? And it doesn't involve a board seat, things like that. Yeah. So, um, I think technically we're, we're through with time, yeah? Um, so, any other questions, you are welcome to come up and ask these great panelists. So, thank you guys. Uh, I think this was fabulous. I hope you thought so too.